A cool day after school, Frankie T, who would drown his brother by accident that coming spring and would use length of pipe to beat a woman in a burglary years later, had me pinned on the ground behind a backstop, his breath sour as meat left out the sun. I stared at his face, shaped like the sole of a shoe, and just went along with the insults, although now and then I tried to raise a shoulder in a half-hearted struggle because that was part of the game. He let his drool yo-yo from his lips, missing my feet by only inches, after which he giggled and called me my names. Finally, he let me up. I slapped grass from my jacket and pants and pulled my shirt tail from my pants to shake it out the useful dirt he had stuffed in my collar. I stood by him, nervous and red-faced from struggling, and when he suggested that we climb the monkey bars together, I followed him quietly to the kids' section of the Jefferson Elementary. He climbed first with small grunts, and for the second I thought of running, but knew he would probably catch me, if not then, the next day. There was no way out of being a fifth grader. The daily event of running to teachers to show them your bloody nose, it was just a fact, like having lunch. So I climbed the bars and tried to make conversation. First about the girls in our classroom, then about kickball. He looked at me, smiling as if I had a camera in my hand his green teeth like the underside of a rock, before he relaxed his grin into a simple gray line across his face. He told me to shut up. He gave me a hard stare, and I looked away to a woman teacher walking to her car and wanted very badly to yell for help. She unlocked her door, got in, played with her face in the mirror while the engine warmed, and then drove off with a blue smoke trailing. Frankie was watching me all along, and when I turned to him, he laughed. Chael, you she can't help you, Ease. He moved closer to me on the bars, and I thought he was going to hit me. Instead, he put his arm around my shoulder, squeezing firmly in friendship. Come on, chicken, let's be cool. I opened my mouth and tried to feel happy as he told me what he was going to have for Thanksgiving. My mom has got a turkey and ham and lots of potatoes, yams and stuff like that. I saw him in the refrigerator, and she says, we're going to get some pies. Real ease. Poor liar, I thought, smiling as we clanked our heads softly like good friends. He had seen the same afternoon program on TV as I had, one in which a woman in an apron demonstrated how to prepare a Thanksgiving dinner. I knew he would have tortillas and beans and brown steak, maybe, and oranges from his backyard. He went on describing his Thanksgiving, then changed it over to Christmas. The new bicycle, the clothes, the, the G.I. Joes. I told him that it all sounded swell even though I knew he was making it all up. His mother would, in fact, stand in line of the Salvation Army to come away hugging armfuls of toys that had been trapped back into shape by reformed alcoholics with feigned noises. I pretended to be excited and asked if I could come over to his place to play after Christmas. Oh, yeah, any time, he said, squeezing my shoulder and clinking his head against mine. When he asked what I was having for Thanksgiving, I told him that we would probably be having a ham with pineapple on the top. My family was slightly better off than Frankie's, though I sometimes walked around with cardboard on my shoes and socks with big holes enough to make ski masks out of them. So holidays were extravagant happenings. I told him about the candied hams, the frozen green beans, and the pumpkin pie. His eyes moved across my face as if, if he were deciding where to hit me. The nose, the temple, the chin, the talking mouth. And then he lifted his arm from my shoulder and jumped from the monkey bars, grunting as he landed. He wiped sand from his knees while looking up and warned me not to mess around with him anymore. He stared with such great meanness that I had to look away. He warned me again and then walked away. Incredibly relieved, I jumped from the bars and ran, looking over my shoulder until I turned onto my street. Frankie scared most of the school out of its wits and even had girls scampering off out of view when he showed himself on the playground. If he caught us without notice, we grew quiet and stared down at our shoes until they passed after a threat or two. If he pushed us, we stayed on the ground with our eyes closed and pretended we were badly hurt. If he rifled through our lunch bags, we didn't say anything. He took what he wanted, after which we sighed and watched him walk away after peeling an orange or chewing big chunks of an apple. Still, that afternoon, when we, he called Mr. Colligan, our teacher, a foul name, we grew scared of him. Mr. Colligan pulled and tugged at his body until he was in his arms and then out of his arms as he hurled frankly against the building. Some of us looked away because it was unfair. We knew the house he lived in. 
the empty refrigerator, the father gone, the mother in a sad bathrobe, the beatings, the yearnings for something to love. When a teacher manhandled him, we all wanted to run away. But instead we stared and felt ashamed. Robert, Adele, Yolanda, shamed. Danny, Alfonso, Brenda, shamed. Nash, Margie, Racha, shamed. We all watched him flop about us as Mr. Colgan shook and grew red from anger. We knew his house, and for some reason, it was the same one to walk home to. The broken mother, the indifferent walls, the refrigerator's glare, which fed the people no one wanted.